What's up, guys? Welcome back. We have two very special guests here today who I've been following for quite a while, and I'm excited to get some fresh new perspectives. Uh, I guess to start, if you guys want to just introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your investing journey and the companies you're interested in. And uh, Arnie, why don't you lead us off? Thank you for having me here, Vinny. Uh, my pleasure. I'm uh, Arnie, and I'm just uh, um, I'm trying to build my process as a full-time investor. And uh, I have a previous experience in uh, finance, as I was uh, uh, sharing before. And uh, I realized, OK, I want to have a, a deep professional experience to understand how things work. Uh, but I don't want to be uh, stressed uh, like the average uh, um, institutional investor, because that prevents you from being detached uh, and often to make the right thing. So from that, I started developing my own approach uh, that actually became a betting against <laughs> the uh, analyst, uh, not because they are not smart or whatever, but because I realized many times uh, their perspective is very different from the perspective of a business owner, which is the perspective I want to have uh, as I build my framework as a uh, value investor. And Arnie, Arnie, it. don't lie. Don't lie. You don't think those guys are smart. Come on. Uh, no, he's, he's smart, <laughs> uh, but in a, in a different way from uh, being uh, smart uh, in an abstract um, level. Because you can be very good at solving a certain kind of things, uh, but missing the big abstractions. Or maybe you're just not interested. So, for instance, uh, B Buffett is not the smartest uh, person in the world, uh, but uh, he deploys his uh, IQ in a mass proficient way because uh, he used that uh, intelligence to manage his emotions and read through the numbers. While uh, Wall Street analysts uh, use all their IQ to write reports and be liked uh, by clients. It's a different job. So for sure they are smarter, much smarter than me in mm. uh, rank, uh, going up on the career level. I want to become smarter than them in actually making good choices. <laughs> and making like money. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a lot of, you know, it's all subjective and Wall Street, yeah, you, you could be brilliant, but it's just a different mindset. It's a lot more short-term focused, quarterly, you know, quarter over quarter results versus I think I'm getting that you're more into the long term. Uh, Manuel, how about you? Yeah, so uh, I'm a building engineer and uh, an investor. So now about... Uh, two and a half years that I took control of my, my full portfolio. So just uh, my experience on the social medias, on the Substack, uh, Twitter, and my YouTube, it's more of a documentation process, uh, you know, tracking my thoughts, uh, inspired a lot by uh, Dave Lee and his uh, investing process. So same as me, I wanted to document my, my thoughts. And along the way, uh, I've met Arnaldo. So we've been working together pretty closely for the last five months. Uh, we've been... Uh, Already. We've been... <laughs> we've done uh i think we've done some decent work in the last uh, few months uh with all those networks we're working hard on our twitter substack and all the rights great articles so i'm helping him out on those and that's it just trying to stay focused uh keep out the noise document think properly and uh and just uh see things properly not in a short-term view but with a 20x vision is why i call it that's why i have the 20x next to my name it's not a, a type of showing off of trying to 20x my portfolio or do something crazy it's just having a 20x vision a clear vision uh, thinking through the noise i love that yeah and you guys have been doing some great work you know i, I see your your follower count is definitely growing exponentially and uh link to all your guys stuff down below you guys should definitely check out their uh youtube channels sub stacks and twitter lots of great info spread throughout all those platforms and then i guess as far as you know what are some of the big investments that you're into but right now my portfolio is uh, very simple i have uh, some 40 percent of the position that depends on the price uh, on palantir then uh, a smaller position on amd I had uh, a big position on Apple that I gradually basically sold uh, almost all of it uh, because what happened right now is uh, the, the one risk that I was really take, afraid of when I was uh, invested in Apple, basically the risk is uh, an escalation of Taiwan. And in these recent months, uh, we saw exactly that. Meanwhile, the price uh, skyrocketed. It's like, okay. Now the risk is rising. Maybe nothing will happen. 
But since I considered Apple my cash-like uh, position, I can't afford uh, that to suddenly drop for something I can't control. Actually, I want to benefit from the other side uh, if something goes worse in that direction. I hope not, but if that happens, I want to be ready to deploy aggressively on Palantir because uh, I know that uh, they would benefit from uh, uh, chaos rising. And apart from that, I have a very small positions. Uh, well, I have a couple of shares in uh, Tesla because a company I love. Uh, I actually one of the very early known investors. <laughs> I lost uh, dramatically my opportunity to become a millionaire. Even if I was studying it from 2014, I was following the lives uh, of the Model 3. I mean, Compared with the average, average investor, I was kind of early, but my, especially later when I became a financial analyst, the framework of a financial analyst really prevented me to see things with a long-term perspective. Because what I was seeing is this company costs a lot on all the metrics and they're burning cash like something I've never seen. At the time I was investing only in companies with 20, 30% margins growing 20, 30%, not paying more than 30, 30 times P. I mean, very, very, I would, we would call it quality value investing style. So something like that would be untouchable for me. And I didn't touch it. My Let me ask you, Arnie. <laughs> Back in 2014, the uh, the ratios and the, the expensiveness of Tesla, was that was still the narrative back in 2014 because I only joined in 2016 and I ignored all those metrics. I, mean, I still barely know what they are, but well, <laughs> back in 2014, it was, really, it was still really volatile. Expensive. But uh, even when it dropped, uh, since it was uh, a cash-burning business, uh, for me it was, okay, how can, how can I put money on this uh, that uh, has uh, better, I mean, they don't have uh, that much cash. Uh, probably they will need to raise new equity. I don't want to be diluted. Uh, too too difficult. I avoid. But that's a mess. I mean, that's a huge uh, opportunity missed. Uh, that's what I'm not willing to do with Palantir because I realize uh, there is the same alpha component, <laughs> I like to call it, where you see that there is something so powerful is not expressed yet. But this time I will not uh, waste the opportunity. I want to build the compound knowledge so that if the opportunity arises and the opportunity is so big and I recognize it because I study the company so well, then I can bet really aggressively on it. Yeah, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And going back to what you said, you know, just making me think of Peter Lynch has often said that you know, he went to business school and he had to unlearn everything that he learned there to become a successful investor. And Tesla's a perfect example. You look at a company like NVIDIA that trades flat for 10 years. Wall Street is never going to go for that because, again, like it's just more of a quarter over quarter. They're not looking at that long term vision. And Tesla in 2014 was very risky. Um, and obviously they, they almost went under multiple times. But, you know, if you had looked at the long term vision, maybe put a little bit in at least, and uh, you just kind of ride it out. I've been in Tesla since 2019, so that's my biggest position. Uh, and we're going to see where that one goes. That's a company that really excites me. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned Apple too. It's it's tricky. Like this is something I've been trying to do with my portfolio because I want to cut down the total positions I have. Apple's one of my biggest. I have, you know, my index funds are up there. I have some meta. Um, and I, I just want to simplify everything. I think I have probably somewhere in the 20s of total individual holdings. And I just want to get it way down because there just comes a point where I, I can't possibly keep up with all these and I, I'd be better off just in the index at that point and then holding, you know, maybe three to five high conviction plays. And a company like Apple, yeah, in the short term, there's, there's all kinds of issues potentially with Taiwan. But even beyond that, I just see a company that they, they're dominant and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. But they're at the top of their S curve. You know, I feel like there are better opportunities until the next Steve Jobs comes along. Apple is not growing like Tesla is going to be growing, I think, for the next few years. Is that true? Yeah, I, you, you agree with I, that S curve? Are they on the top? Is there anything more for Apple to be achieved? I would say there is uh, still a lot to be achieved, uh, especially in the field where just experimenting uh, that went uh, 
very under the radar, but uh, as I was uh, very nerdy, I really paid attention to it, which was the advertising, because mm. from last year, they started uh, making uh, life more difficult for Meta, and I thought, mm, maybe it's not only that. But actually, what they did was developing a very strong advertising business, basically promote having the advertising in the App Store, so that uh, companies uh, like uh, uh, apps, uh, to promote them, they need to pay Apple directly to have a visibility on that. And you know, is uh, for them, is basically zero cost business, uh, but potentially the more the network of iPhone users expand, uh, the more this becomes valuable. And uh, in China, they have a so big opportunity to untap that advertising in China alone could be really, really massive. That without considering the, the car, uh, the uh, VR and so on, which will be important, but uh, are, those are more for the long-term vision in my opinion. Despite the VR headset should arrive in the next few years, uh, for me, it's like, okay, I consider that not relevant. The advertising is here, is already damaging other competitors. Uh, and they're really taking a big chunk of it. Can I ask a question, Vinny? Oh, sorry, I was going to ask a question. And Vinny, you have to excuse me. Sometimes I take the role of a host. I just like asking questions more than <laughs> more than answering. But guys, we mentioned the China thing. And, and I mentioned to Arnaldo a couple of times that this China risk Taiwan is always has always existed. And it will always exist until something disastrous happens, which I really hope doesn't. But um, the management team, CEO and the others, Aren't they aware of this or weren't they aware of this in the past? Maybe they have more insight than we do. Like we're always, because it's always in the news. So we're fearful, but maybe they knew or know how to mitigate the risk. Because are you thinking they're they're ready to lose their $2 trillion business because of uh, one push of a button? Yeah, I mean, the whole Taiwan thing is is wild. And just seeing what's happened so far in 2022, things that you would never <laughs> expect would ever happen in the modern day. You know, nothing's off the table at this point. Yeah. If Taiwan, if it goes down, like, I mean, it's going to affect way more than just Apple. We are going to be utterly crippled. But I would like to think that this is why, you know, we're, we're our uh, government, our the powers that be are realizing this and hopefully trying to bring some of what we get from over there back home. And that's why we've got like this Chips Act and stuff. And while yeah. it seems like it's too little and not really focused where it needs to be, it's it's we're moving in the right direction. And just like you could thank Russia for this, that we're kind of I could see the trend shifting away now from globalization or you're going to have these two uh, sects of the world where like maybe we do start to bring a lot of that back home and maybe that would be for the best. It's, it's hard and it's I don't know how you're going to navigate things like, uh, you know, the competing on, on the, the wage costs and, and stuff like that, obviously. Yeah. They do it so much better and so much cheaper. So we've got a lot of catching up to do. But I would hope that we've kind of had this wake up call and that these supply chains will become more diversified and resilient. Yeah, that, mm, that's what uh, I think the direction is too. Apple is already thinking of uh, making uh, manufacturing and assembling uh, in, uh, in India. For sure, they will uh, take uh, advantage of uh, the manufacturing plants uh, built uh, in the US as well. Very uh, real. Well, over the long term, uh, I'm sure they will they will do fine, uh, and uh, Tim Cook uh, is 100% aware of. Uh, what I'm I don't like as an investor right now is uh, I can't consider Apple as a safe position because the risk potentially is there. We saw it with that uh, as you said with COVID, uh, you know, it's there, but you don't think it can be a real risk. I don't want. Uh, a position that I consider safe to actually suddenly uh, be at risk. And the risk from uh, Apple is not only on Taiwan per se, because they manufacture, well, TSMC manufactures uh, the chip for them, but uh, I would say it's more related to their relationship with China, because uh, the real strength of Apple is that they built a very good relationship with the CCP. They, while the US actually ditches the Chinese manufacturers, they banned Huawei, Apple has a very deep, strong relationship with CCP. Actually, differently from the US, 
the CCP actually can have access to the iPhone. So it's a weird uh, thing with uh, related to the pri privacy, but in China is okay. And right now, Apple is loved. Uh, the CCP supports it because basically they bring the innovation there. They support a lot of jobs. Uh, so it's good for the CCP to have Apple there. But let's say the relationships uh, break uh, between the US and China. That could be a huge risk. So right now, unless the price uh, again goes uh, very, very low, I'm just not confident. It's something uh, since uh, I, I'm aware of the, of the dynamic, but I'm not a geopolitical expert. For me, it's like, okay, that is becoming too hard. Differently from, from years ago, where the risk was there, but it was not becoming explicit. Right now, we are seeing the risk becoming explicit. Can I ask and a I, question, Vinny? I'll, I'll ask you a question. Sorry, two, twofold. Um, uh, related to China, but Tesla-wise. First of all, did you, have you been adding to your position uh, since 2019 in Tesla? And what do you think about Tesla's risk in China? Does that ever worry you in the, in the same light? Or maybe, we're, maybe the news is just bombarding us with stuff that we're not aware of, and maybe there's a better relationship than, than we think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I did the bulk of my Tesla buying 2019, 2020, and then the last year in 2022, 2021, I've kind of just been adding, but not as heavily just because I like to sleep at night and Tesla's already 75% <laughs> of my portfolio. Ooh, so I would nice. like to, I mean, but, but a lot of that is, you know, I'm up 600%. My, my average cost is around $139 a share. Wow, so too you know, I, the way I see it right now is like, I'm going to ride this out because I do really believe this is going to be the biggest company in the world. But at the same time, you know, add the index funds, give me, give me some diversity, but I haven't sold any and I don't plan to anytime soon. As far as China. Yeah. It's a, it's a Faustian bargain. Uh, especially if you look at it from the Western perspective, because they probably, you know, without that China factory, the picture would have looked a lot different. They may not have made it. Um, and that is still the most productive factory. There are still risks to it, but I do like, you know, now once we have, we already have the Texas factory, we've got Berlin, the risk is decreasing, not increasing because they are diversifying away from it. Uh, you obviously still run the risk of, you know, China loves to steal IP and I'm sure there's already been a lot of that going on, but, you know, like Apple, I think Tesla does have a good relationship with China, with the CCP, and they've given them favorable treatment. I mean, unheard of stuff where Tesla's able to actually own this factory, not have to partner with a, a local Chinese company, which is the playbook that they always use for, for everyone else. So mm. I think China saw that this was a mutually beneficial, China needed EVs, Tesla was a great way to kind of get that going. And, you know, for, for, the, for now, I think it's a, a healthy relationship. And obviously, Tesla, it's in their best interest to keep it that way. But I think, again, it's, it benefits both parties. And they are going to diversify away from it. So I think the risk decreases uh, as we move forward here. That's good. Uh, impressive that you have the, that cost basis, by the way, and that you haven't sold good for you. Nice. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's I, tough you, when you look at the short term. And that's why I just try and like, you know, not make any impulsive moves and, uh, you know, take the news, wait a, a few weeks. I've definitely gotten better <laughs> at uh, kind of just numb to everything going on here. With good. 2022, especially like just it, it. Yeah, just absolute craziness. Have you ever uh, had the impulse of selling? I definitely have. Yeah. And uh, it, it gets tough. You know, it's challenging because you feel like the sky is falling, but uh, holding strong. So when it was you know, dropping, so... not when it was uh, rising. Yeah. I, you know, in hindsight, probably the smart thing to do is when the CEO <laughs> of all of these uh, great companies back in, you know, late fall 2021 are selling 10% of their, their positions probably was a good sign to uh, trim a little bit. But I didn't. And uh, I just feel like long term, you know, if it really works out the way I, I'm looking at it, I'm yeah. best off just holding it. Yeah, I agree. What do that's you good. define with be... long term? Because that's all actually the question uh, I keep asking myself uh, and uh, everyone speaks uh, long term. Well, also <laughs> with Palantir, everyone was speaking long term, but uh, one week uh, guidance and then everyone <laughs> is not a long term. <laughs> yeah. Long yeah, we definitely we could talk some pounds here, but uh, I would say five to 10 years. So I, I think by 2025, we're going to have a very good kind of assessment of reality. Whereas right now, people can kind of get away still with saying, oh, competition's coming. Oh, like they're not going to have the lead, blah, blah. But the way things are I'm moving. waiting for that. 
Yeah, exactly. The way things are moving, I think by 2025, you know, Tesla really just has to stay on the current path. Like they've already got the recipe for success. They just have to rinse and repeat, which is basically what they're doing with these giga, new giga factories. And that's the other thing. Every new factory just gets that much better. Um, and that's one of Tesla's many key long-term competitive advantages is they're just going to be superior at manufacturing. They continue to innovate beyond the car. Just uh, the manufacturing process is something that isn't paid attention to enough. But uh, I just feel like by 2025, we're going to have a very good look at, you know, separating the men from the boys and who's got what share of market and what's actually happening. And by that point, it will be painfully obvious um, if Tesla continues, you know, to execute that no one's catching them. And even if they do catch them, it, it'll be, I can foresee a scenario where it just gets to a point where it's too late, where you have like what Apple did with the iPhone, you know, better smartphones come out, but Apple's got superior branding. They already captured a significant chunk of the market. And, you know, Tesla really only needs 10, 20% of the global market would get them that 10 to 20 million vehicle sales. You company that with their insane profit margins and they're going to be way ahead. You know, they're going to have way more free cash flow. It's just exponentially increasing. They're going to be able to pump that money into all these other initiatives that are really just getting started. Uh, I don't even really like full self-driving, you know, the power storage, solar panels, the, the Tesla bot. I don't even really factor like FSD yeah. and the Tesla bot in. I just see them as like the cherry on top. Um, if they can pull these things off, I mean, you can't even quantify the value they're going to create. But even just looking at vehicle production and, uh, you know, where they're at with that, they have the best supercharger network. Like nobody is close. They just have so many advantages that I don't see that gap closing anytime soon. Exactly. Okay, well, let I me can speak tell to you, I live uh, in a small town and that is generally very late to innovation. When something arrives uh, here in Lecco, it's probably very, very strong. It's viral. And I can tell you that every time I take the car, I see at least two Tesla around. <laughs> yeah, I, I just driving around here. It's uh, just uh, year over year. I should really just start tracking like year over year, <laughs> you know, exponentially. Like when I go on road trips, I literally will see hundreds of Teslas. You can make a video on your data. Yeah, I was, Tesla just thinking, I was just thinking every time, every time you go out, you say the kilometers and the time you've been in your car and how many Teslas you saw. So we could do a ratio on that. <laughs> yeah. So that's, there was that's an advertising. Basically... Uh, Based uh, on uh, how many girls uh, looked at you, you <laughs> and you can make that on Tesla. Tesla. <laughs> That's actually the way I buy Tesla now. <laughs> Going back to like if I'm still purchasing, every Tesla I see on the road, I'll put ten dollars in. So some oh, days man. is more than others. Sometimes when I do a road trip, it's uh, I have to dollar cost average it in a little bit. But uh, that's what I'm doing these days. You could do those small purchases. Is that, is that what you're seeing you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Which is that? Oh, nice. That's good. That's great. I wanted to ask you uh, first a comment and then a, a question. Uh, first of all, I have FSD. I have a Model X with the FSD, and I and I got the beta about two months ago, and I could say it's it's really really very good, very very good. At a, I don't know how to quantify it, but like a ninety percent level, it's really really amazing much better than you know the initial version that i had so on that front they're making they're making leaps and you bounds have to pay more I, I bought the fsd package initially with the car so i mm -hmm. considered that as an investment so it was about ten thousand, but i bought into the story that as it increases and gets better it'll be worth 20 plus thousand so i said okay, okay. Mix, i was curious about money. the update no, the update free because okay. no, because I bought it. So once I get that, now I have FSD for life. So I saw that as an investment. Vin, what you mentioned about Tesla, we didn't even talk about the Cybertruck and the Semi, which probably are two huge, huge uh, uh, catalysts in in the next couple couple of years. Vin, I wanted to ask you when you said the noise before you filter out the noise because there's been a lot of, but that that's been a, a recent change I've been I've made because before there was a lot of news, a lot of. Uh, people talking like even on the all-in podcast for example when you listen i love that show but i listen to them They're, these guys are like saying who's buying the market you're crazy if you're buying the market and then uh, other youtube guys and twitter and the rest there was so much noise especially recently how uh, how did you navigate those waters how did you filter it out do you do you limit the, the amount that you're taking in yeah no great question i, I love the all-in podcast too you know i always listen to them and uh i know like chamath has sold out of tesla despite pumping it for years and like yeah yeah I, you're seeing that trend with a lot of these youtubers um i will say like since i started my own channel i watch a lot less other channels okay, just because like i'm spending more time doing my own thing and yeah definitely just i don't 
I, every time I see these like thumbnails with the fire and like it's over, <laughs> immediate skip, like not not a yeah, disaster. Clicking on that, and I've actually I've gone to the point. I think this helps a lot too. I just prefer to listen to like long form content like this. This is uh, like a thirty minute uh, video or like hour long interviews with like people who actually know what they're talking about, understand the company. Cause these like five, 10 minute clickbait, like things are just utter nonsense. And like, I listen to it and I'm like, this is just not true. Like there's no, th your, your bear case is completely off, you know? <laughs> um, so I think I've just kind of, uh, my BS radar has gone exceptionally, uh, honed, you know, dealing with the, all the FUD the last few years to now when I see it, like it's, it's comical, you know, the constant hip pieces. And now the latest is this, the, what's his name? Uh, Dan O'Dowd, the, the real scam O'Dowd over there does his fake, you know, FSD test where it hits a cardboard kid. But in yeah, reality, yeah. <laughs> it, it literally comes out that he pressed on the accelerator and like forced the autopilot to disengage. But people who, who the naysayers see that headline and they believe it as fact. And my uh, uh, cousin of mine sent it to me the other day. He sent it. He goes, oh, did you see it hit the kid? I go send it to me. He sends it to me. I go first of all without even thinking. I'm like it's obviously fake. It's so ridiculous that thing. Yeah, and that's definitely a big issue. I mean, what do you think? Like, should te I know Tesla starts to? There are people who think you know they should be investing in a PR team that could then quickly just denounce this nonsense for what it is. But uh, I, I just also feel like long term, again, it's just all noise and the actions. The product is going to speak louder than all this, and it's just. Even without it, I mean, clearly the demand is not slowing down. So people, there's got to be some people who are, are smart out there who understand. And I just feel like as time passes, as they become, you know, not the only company that's doing FSD and EVs, that uh, it kind of takes a scrutiny off them and just people realize, like, start, start to be able to separate fact from fiction a little better. Uh, I wanted to jump in before I forget. Sorry, I thought about it before. Just a side note for Arnoldo. He loves the buybacks. Elon Musk mentioned the buyback possibility in the future if they get excess cash. I think you were mentioning the free cash flow. So just that on that level, that would be fantastic. I think mean, let me uh, double down on that, uh, the noise question. Some of the channels, or especially since you have so, so much in uh, Tesla, and when it's it's varying from 700 to 900, I'm sure it has a major effect on your net worth, You know, your paper net worth. On the when it was below seven hundred, did uh, does your heart skip a beat at all? Or when you see other channels, perhaps saying Tesla is still overvalued, there's much more to go down. We're going sub five. Uh, how how do you filter that specifically? Let's say uh, like we felt uh, five weeks ago. Yeah, it. Uh, I, I think it was hardest. You know, early twenty twenty two when the sky was falling, it was the hardest. And then I kind of just got used to it to the point <laughs> where like I don't even care if it hits five hundred at this point, I'll just be loading the boat. You know, oh, nice. And I, I just kind of realized like. Nobody knows what they're talking about short term. You could say anything. It may or may not come true. And I just kind of look at it that way. I, I keep, you know, looking at the numbers, looking at what management says, look at the evidence. And the, the story has not changed. So I just try not, not to even pay attention to the stock price, except for, you know, a buying opportunity. Um, so, yeah, Thanks. I just kind of felt getting good at filtering it all out, I think. <laughs> Great for question for you, Vinny. Because before you you quoted uh, Peter Lynch, who is my favorite investor, and uh, actually very responsible for the investment approach I developed, but also he, he contributed to not uh, uh, make me invest in Tesla because uh, there is a chapter saying uh, the hot or the fancy stock. Yeah. And uh, I remember when I read it first, that was actually the definition of Tesla. Right. <laughs> that was actually what prevented me a lot for a long time. Actually, okay. I mean, everyone loves this company. I, I just don't, I just can't. But you see that even following uh, the best investors advice, uh, you don't really need to follow them blindly. You need to detach and say, okay, okay, this company is loved. Does the, does the price already incorporate too much love compared with the real potential? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great point. I've, I've thought about that as well. I think what he says in that regard, that you want to stay away from the hottest stock in the industry, it applies to everyone that came after. So like Polestar, Neo, stuff like that, because... Te Te Tesla is that generational special company that is the exception to the rule is what I believe. Um, Cause everyone else right now, 
they're just trying to copy. They're trying to catch up to what Tesla did 10 years ago. And now they're, they're already on to bigger and better things with FSD and, and everything else. So I, there's another Lynch quote that I, I really like too, is that, you know, uh, you shouldn't water, you, you shouldn't, how does he say it? Uh, you shouldn't throw out your flowers and cut and your flowers. Uh. <laughs> you shouldn't punish your winners and, you know, put more money into your losers because that's the equivalent to throwing out your flowers and watering your weeds. And that's something I've already just seen the last couple of years. You know, I've tried to make some other investments outside of Tesla and all that money, they didn't work, you know, a lot, many of them did not work out and it would have been better off just sticking in Tesla, you know, sticking with your winners. Like these companies are winning for a reason. And uh, when you've got that management team and you've got, you know, just looking at things like where are the top two destinations that engineers out of college want to go. Number one is Tesla. Number two, SpaceX, or it, it flip flops back and forth, but they can work at both companies if they want to. I mean, you just factor in all these, you know, seemingly small competitive advantages and you just have an insane moat and, you know, no, no sign of slowing down anytime soon. So yeah, I, I, I think that that's a great quote. And like Tesla is just the exception, you know, it's that one, like, this is, I think going to be the best company I'd probably invest in, in my lifetime, you know, there's a good right, chance. Right. You know what? This sentence, exact sentence is actually the sentence on which I made a mistake on Palantir. <laughs> because uh, when I entered that uh, DPO and the prices skyrocketed in a very little time, I thought Peter Lynch would not cut uh, <laughs> the flowers. <laughs> and, uh, I, I cut some flowers, but I really didn't take the, the big scissors. And actually I realized that here, I realized that, okay, the, these principles from great investors are true, but uh, must be always contextualized. Because for instance, uh, with Palantir, it's true, I didn't want to cut the winner, but when it became a winner at $40, $40 per share, the price uh, compared with the fundamentals were completely mad. I realized it, but I was, oh, no, no, no. I mean. Don't cut the flowers. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's tough because you got to look at it case by case. Like that can be one aspect of your analysis, but you got to look at it from multiple angles. And uh, on that note, we're just about out of time here, but this is awesome. Definitely got to do this again. Thank you guys for coming on. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it, Vinny. It was fun. Lots of fun. Thanks so much.